brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. Sometimes I think the modernists in Rome simply cannot help themselves. Sometimes they tell the truth. Not in a way that's good for their cause, though. Sometimes they just tell us what they're really doing, why they're doing it, and in so doing, they make our point for us. To use a common saying to describe this, they say the quiet part out loud. These unintended truths bolster the cause of faithful Catholics against the modernist heretics who are trying to subvert the church for their own purposes. And today I have such a story for you, where the modernists say the quiet part out loud, and the rest of us are left wondering, what is anybody going to do anything about it? So our story today comes from the Vatican itself, where Cardinal Mario Goresh told us what the Synod of Synodality is doing to continue the revolution of Vatican II in our time. That's not really news per se, but when he said this, he made an admission that no one saying that has made yet. The story comes from the website of the Cardinal Secretary of Synod's own website, buried in the Vatican website, which I saw because a pro-Francis Catholic journalist tweeted a link to it, and for which I thank him. <laughs> Let's get the words from the Vatican's own archived trusted site itself. Headline, 250 Years of the Pontifical Lateran University. Address of Cardinal Gresh on the Second Vatican Council and the Synodal Process. So there's a claim being made here, and the claim is that the Synod is continuing the work of Vatican II, but beyond what the Council of Fathers could envision, which is a similar claim that was made at Vatican II about the First Vatican Council. I've made the claim for the past year or more that the Synod is just Vatican III, and I think that Cardinal Gresh is going to agree with me here. So from his press release article, quote, The Cardinal spoke this morning at the opening of the hashtag 250PUL with a Lectio Magistralis on the Second Vatican Council and Synodality. For the Secretary General of the Synod, the current synodal process is a, quote, mature fruit of Vatican II and shows how a, quote, correct reception of the Council's ecclesiology is activating such fruitful processes as to open up scenarios that not even the Council had imagined, and in which the action of the Spirit that guides the Church is made manifest. Dwelling then on the next steps of the ongoing synodal process, the Cardinal explained why the document for the continental stage will be sent to the local churches, explaining at the same time the concept of, quote, restitution. Quoting him directly, If the prophetic dimension resides in the people of God, the totality of the baptized, see Lumen Gentium, paragraph 12, and the first act of the church is listening, then it is precisely to the people of God that the outcome of that listening must be returned. And since the people of God live in the churches, the document must be sent to the churches, end quote. And by churches, he means national churches like the USCCB and that kind of thing. Now, the admission that they're going beyond Vatican II is huge, though. What we're seeing is a return of the spirit of Vatican II fully triumphant, a spirit that the modernists have successfully made reside in the hearts of the vast majority of the laity. At the present, a document is being worked on at the Vatican that will then be returned to the local churches, again, meaning national bishops, conferences, and it'll filter down to the dioceses from there. And at each of those places, the bishops will then ask select a laity for their input on what this looks like and provide probably a counterproposal. I can see how this is going to go horribly wrong, especially since it's pretty much an open secret at this point that select laity are being permitted to provide input at that level of discourse, and their proposals are probably going to look strikingly similar anywhere you go in the church. Cardinal Grish is on the record supporting the ordination of women and the creation of an ecumenical liturgy of some kind that is noticeably absent of Christ, which kind of begs the question of what the point is other than to navel gaze and worship man. But again, I digress. The laity and the desires of the laity are front and center now, and as long as the laity line up with the vision for the church that Francis and his henchmen have for it, then the laity will be used as the, as the excuse to change the faith in some way. And it will all be seen as a movement of the spirit to affect this change. All this is coming, folks, whether we like it or not. The only question is how bad will this change look? Cardinal Grish makes this clear in his affirmation that the hierarchy have to listen to the local churches for some reason. So here's a newsflash for the cardinal. The princes of the church are to uphold the faith, clarify points of confusion, correct error, repudiate sin, and of course, 
offer the perpetual sacrifice of the Eucharist. They are to spread the gospel and protect what has been handed to them, not to change things because the lady have imbibed far too deeply of the culture of the world. Back to the press release, though. Quote, For the secretary of the synod, this important ecclesial act is neither a concession nor a deterrence or deference, rather, to those on the margins of a project. It is not a gesture of bon ton to gain some sympathy or some cheap consensus, not even a report, indeed an account, to someone who claims the right to know. It is a purely synodal ecclesial act, reflecting in the circularity of the process the, quote, mutual interiority that exists between the particular churches and the universal church. In short, for Cardinal Gresh, sending the document for the continental stage to the churches is a, quote, unquote, due act. Lastly, the Secretary General concluded his speech with a wish that, quote, the church continues to live the synodal process in the logic of listening to God and to others, to the spirit in others. If there is one disposition that the council fathers lived and handed down to the church as a legacy, it is that of listening to one another to hear what the spirit is saying to the church, end quote. This statement caused a stir online when Cardinal Gresh had been quoted as saying that the synod was revitalizing the church. To revitalize the church, error and heresy need to be corrected and suppressed. The faith taught, and a call to repentance issued by Rome, not some game of adopting the world's values in a way that dresses up secularism as a new type of Catholicism. Elsewhere, Mark Lambert, writing on his website on all this claim, on all this claim of revitalizing the faith, using the laity as an excuse to push, frankly, heresy, he really nails the question at hand when ask, when he asks what's actually the point. Remember, the laity are poorly catechized. He makes this point himself. It's why you bother watching Catholic content on YouTube or going to blogs in the first place. You want to learn the faith because for some reason you're not getting it from the conventional places you should be. And yet the uncatechized or let's be honest, malcatechized laity are being asked to use their catechetical foundation to change the faith. That is what's happening here. From Mr. Lambert's piece on this, quote, revitalize it, meaning the church, how? By walking away from church teachings? We have seen that modeled in numerous Protestant denominations, and what we know the result is, is irrelevance and oblivion. It is widely recognized that the majority of baptized Catholics are not practicing, and of those that are practicing, only a small minority are able to articulate their faith with any clarity. Given this reality, it seems a foregone conclusion that what any survey will reveal, the lack of belief in church teachings on uh, the flesh, divorce, etc., etc., we were assured that this was not the case. Although it was not clear what then the purpose of such a time-consuming endeavor could possibly be. Now, the official synod media team have posted a series of pictures to help us understand, end quote. And he goes on to show a number of these blasphemous images posted by the official Synod account. I showed them some of them in a video last week. I'm going to spare you more of them here, but they surround the church with the with the lingo and catchphrases and propaganda of the secular world at this time, which is not which is an apt way, honestly, of showing how dire the situation is. The church is indeed surrounded on all sides by her secular adversaries, and their values have infiltrated the church. Hence why you see someone occasionally popping in the comments here on this channel or on Dr. Marshall's channel or anywhere else you're watching, doing it from time to time, decrying traditional commentators as apparently being too attached to America's allegedly conservative political party, as if any of us spends that much time on this stuff and as if the alternative to them anyway are actually Catholic in any way. At least no one paying worth paying attention to spends a whole lot of time anymore making Catholic content about secular politics. Cardinal Grish, Francis, and the rest think they're going to respond to the crisis in the church by of a total collapse in the faith among the laity by essentially embracing what the laity believe in, to secularism, secular values of the flesh, the James Martin sin, all of that. And they're going to attempt to make that Catholic. That will, of course, fail. It's not really Catholicism to do that at all. You can't baptize a lie. It's just that these people refuse to admit that. And there's a real solution to this. Father Hunwick on his blog had a short thought about why the modernists hate tradition. And it's really pretty simple. The priest frames it in a conversation he had with several laity while in Ireland recently. Here's what he said, quote, Perhaps a couple of years ago in Western Ireland, I had the privilege to be in the company 
of a very great prelate just after he had offered a pontifical high mass in the old rite. Suddenly, quite out of the blue, he murmured, So beautiful, so beautiful. Why do they hate it so much? Afterwards, I started to recall the events which followed our entry into full communion with the See of Peter. A determined effort was made to prevent my own admission to the Presbyteriate of the Latin Church. During those long, difficult, and extraordinarily painful months, I had the advice and support of some very good and holy men. I shall eternally be grateful to them. I remember all of the things that were said to me. One of them said, and repeated it a number of times, John, you simply must realize how strongly these people feel about the quote-unquote extraordinary form. Another said he would explain to me why there was such prejudice against the old mass. Quoting him directly, it's because they associate it with a form of Catholicism which they think of as rigid, sin-obsessed, oppressive, and frankly, frightening. They are afraid that with the old mass, the entire moral and cultural complex which they think they remember will return, and the thought terrifies them. As the Bergoglians attack the faith, it seems to me that the most insidious detail is their attempt to keep the old mass entirely out of normal parish life. But we need priests and parochial ministry who share the mind and methods of the great Father Tim, once so gloriously of Blackfin. God forbid that the old mass should be, or even appear to be, a precious ghetto for precious and exclusive clergy and for lady anxious to hide away from their Catholic from their fellow Catholics. What is necessary is, quote, dual economy parishes, such as those often provided by the oratories, an easy and gracious and unneurotic symbiosis. Joseph Ratzinger said in the 1990s when some English Catholic bishops were violently resisting a, quote, unquote, corporate solution for Anglican Catholics, quoting Ratzinger directly, what are they so afraid of? So to answer the question in my heading, fear. They hate the old right because the enemy has set fear in their hearts. And as C.S. Lewis once put it, our foes are those who have no joy. Fear is his weapon of choice. End quote. I'll have Father Hunwick's article linked in the show notes today at return to tradition.org. It's worth reading for yourself. But where's the priest wrong? I'm not personally a believer in mutual enrichment. I've been to diocesan parishes where both the Novus Ordo and TLM are offered regularly. And while I am aware that some parishes coexist happily together, the parish that I belonged to for a time that had this mutual enrichment experiment going up sequestered all of the traditional mask attendees away from the rest of the parish community. They did it by not having events for the parish going on anywhere near the mass times that the traditional mass was happening. Everything shut down when the trads were at mass. And then they mysteriously picked up again once they were safely gone. And I know that that parish isn't the only one like that either. But otherwise, I do agree with Father Hunwick here. But his observation rests on the assumption that what is desired is actually a restoration of the faith, a revitalization of the church. I'm not convinced at all that that is what the modernists want. But I'm curious what you think about this. Is Cardinal Grace essentially responding to fear of the old moral, liturgical, and frankly, theological order in the church returning by turning to the laity in a weird moment of democracy in the church in order to make the church somehow more appealing to those who got up, walked away, and left, and in so doing has functionally left the faith himself. Is the spirit actually moving the synod? Maybe you take the opposite of position. I'm curious what you think about this, so let me know in the comments, please. And like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. As does sharing these messages on social media. That helps a lot as well. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.